By the way, uh, Tom, just as an aside, you know, you always came to us in SAC. We always had the boards full of your great articles, and we just happened to have uh, borrowed Vanna White. Vanna, you want to just swing across in the back over here? Uh -huh. A little low, yeah. We have we have a a very uh, smaller version of your articles, but they are no less meaningful because even though we don't have as many or the capacity to show as many, Tom has written so many great ones. And I know that you're going to share with uh, me later that he is truly a unique person in the sports writing field because he not only writes about football and he knows so much about everything. In fact, a couple of years ago, he wrote a book about baseball called Game 7, and it was a hypothetical story about the Cubs and the Red Sox when it was envisioned that neither one would ever win the World Series again. Of course, the Red Sox did screw up that premise, but the book is very interesting. It's a, it's a good read, and I think you would enjoy it. Tom, as I said, has come to Ali so many times. He's been great with us. He's exchanged. He's given us uh, as much dirt as he can without getting in trouble. We appreciate that. But he has really had a difficult task the last few years. You know, he came in right around the time of the Super Bowl back in uh, uh, the earlier years of this da past uh, couple decades. And he has, we haven't seen one since 2011. But what I've really found interesting is for the last three years, in spite of the fact that the Giants have only averaged four wins a year, and for those that aren't into football, that means they've averaged about 12 losses a year. Uh, he's kept it real. He's kept it interesting. And he's kept it so, so much fun to read that you would never know that these giants weren't going anywhere on an annual basis. However, the future is always the positive, upbeat thing that we have to look forward to. And one of the things I think that really made it interesting to me was the fact when Tom was supposed to come in the fall, he had a uh, postponed until the spring because he came out with his new book, which he's going to talk about for us this morning. And the miracle moments in Giants history uh, reminds us that the Giants are a cherished franchise in New York City and in the metropolitan area and around the country. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Tom, who's going to tell us a bit about his book, about his life as a sports writer, and more importantly, about anything and everything we want to know that's football, in the domain that he uh, controls at Newsday. So welcome, Tom, back again, and thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks for having me, Jeff. It's, uh, that, that was quite the introduction. I was glad to see some of my articles still up on the board, even though uh, uh, we're, we're not in that classroom where, where we usually are. It's good to see everybody. Uh, there's a new term now that, that everybody uses. It seems like everybody is wearing their upper wear, which is uh, you know, what you wear when you can only be seen from the waist up. Uh, it's, it's, it's nobody, nobody knows what, what, you, what you're wearing below. So you know, whether it's shorts, sweatpants, pajamas, uh, you know, I, ho I hope everybody's comfortable at home and, and I hope everybody's healthy at home. Uh, yeah, usually I go into my, my introduction about myself and, and my history as a, as a Newsday sports writer. I started on the high school desk in the 1990s, uh, picking up the telephone and answering, uh, answering calls when, when uh, the bowling team would, score, would uh, call in and, and and tell me their their scores and the high school tracks teams and the wrestling events and things like that and I would type in all those all the we call them agates which is the uh, you know the, the tiny little prints that you see in the in the papers the box scores and things like that and eventually started started to, they started to send me out to the field I would write uh, game stories uh, really short ones you know a couple of paragraphs long uh, got to lacrosse and, and basketball and then uh, eventually I became a uh, the outdoors columnist for Newsday uh, covered fishing for about five or six years I think uh, and then in 2006 they asked me to switch from fishing to the NFL which was quite the jump uh, first of all you could you you know there, there were no quotes from the fish obviously you you you, you <laughs> You know, now all of a sudden I was I was dealing with with actual people, uh, and and secondly, I, I had never really covered professional sports, so that was that was a big shock. So for two years I covered the Jets, and then in 2000, after the 2007 season, which is right after they won the Super Bowl, uh, I switched over to the to the Giants, and I've and I've been there ever since, and that's sort of been my sports writing legacy right up until uh, September when. Uh, 
miracle moments in New York Giants football history came out, uh, which is, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't think the word history was, was very important in that title, but uh, it actually became a history book the day it came out, which was September 17th, 2019. Uh, that was the day that the book came out, and that was the day that the Giants benched Eli Manning. And so that was quite the confluence of, uh, of events there because uh, it, was, it was a crazy time for us at Newsday to be uh, covering such, a, such an epic story that they were uh, handing the reins of the franchise over to Daniel Jones at the time, uh, saying goodbye to Eli Manning, which, which turned out to be, uh, you know, he, he would come back for, for two games later in the season. Uh, and, and also dealing with, with the book uh, and, and, you know, as Jeff mentioned, <clears throat> there have been some pretty dry years of late. And I think that really struck home for me when I finished the book and I was looking at the, the final chapters and they, they run in chronological order. And I realized that there were only two players who were on last year's team who were even mentioned in this book. And that was Eli Manning and, and Zach Diossi, who was the long snapper. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that really demonstrates how how dry these last few years have been in terms of miracle moments you know you, you, we talk about this team and 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 sort of uh the ebbs and flows of of giants history uh you know there's there's always a there's, there's always a a peak uh and we tried to capture capture a lot of those in the in the miracle moments book uh i'll take i'll take you a little bit through the process of writing the book uh, so it started about about two years ago. It took about a year to write. Uh, I, I was in touch with a publisher about a separate idea that I thought would make a good book. They disagreed. Uh, they came back with an, uh, with an idea for me uh, and asked if I wanted to write that book. I, I wasn't interested in that. And so finally, we landed on this on this third idea of covering uh, the miracle moments in, in Giants history. They had done a a couple of other books uh, on other teams, the Mets, uh, I think the Islanders have one uh, that, that, it, that is uh, Miracle Moments. And we thought that the Giants would be, would be a good candidate for that. You know, last year was the 100th anniversary, uh, the 100th season, I'm sorry, of, of the NFL. And the Giants have been around for 95 of those. So they certainly had a long history, uh, something that, that isn't always looked at uh, in its entirety. So a lot of times we think back to their history of, uh, the 1950s, uh, many people, it's the 1980s when they when they came of age as Giants fans. Uh, for for an entire generation, it's 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 only the the teams that have won the Super Bowls in 2007 and 11. Uh, but we wanted to look back on all of the the entire history of the of the franchise. Uh, and and so uh, it took about a year of research and reporting. I talked to um, a couple of dozen coaches and. Uh, former players and and uh, as far back as I could as you know unfortunately many of the, the key participants in the in the early days aren't aren't around anymore so that required some research through the archives and uh, 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 looking at um, old newspaper clips and, and old newspaper accounts of, of things and one of the big resources actually was uh, talking to John Mara, who's the co-owner of the of the Giants, and so his father was Wellington Mara, and Wellington was about ten years old when his father Tim Mara bought the Giants in 1925 and started the Giants in 1925. So Wellington Mara had been has been associated with the team throughout his whole life. Uh, he passed away in 2006, and John was his son, and he was able to tell me some of the stories of his father growing up. For instance, one of the things that uh, really stands out is that the Giants are the only team in the NFL that has their bench in the sun. So in other words, when, uh, you know, every team likes to be in the shade because it's cooler in, in, the, uh, in, in the heat. And then when the sun is setting, it's not in their eyes so they can see the field. So the visiting team generally has uh, a disadvantage of being in the, in the sunlight, either early in the season uh, because it's it's too hot, or or they have to squint or wear sunglasses to to see the field as the sun is setting. But the Giants aren't. The Giants are the only team in the NFL that has their home bench on the sun side of the field, and that goes back to Wellington Mara's mother, because early in in this season, uh, early in their first season, Wellington was a ball boy, and he was on the bench with the team, and he got the sniffles, and he came home, and he was sick, and his mother said, "You have to you have to." 
keep him away from the cold side of the field, put him on the, on the warm side of the field. And so uh, Tim Mara, who's, who's the founder of the Giants, said, okay. And they switched sides of the, of the bench at the polo grounds where they were playing at the time. And ever since then, since 1925, the Giants have always stayed on the warm side of the field uh, to keep Wellington Mara, little Wellington Mara, from, from getting the sniffles again. So that, that's kind of a, one of the interesting anecdotes in the book. Uh, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of, a lot of people have uh, a lot of recollections of uh, games and moments and things like that. I, I was really fascinated to go back to the early tw- the 20s and, and the early days of the franchise. You know, their, their first championship was in 1927. And it wasn't even a championship. It was a, it was just a regular season game. And because at the time they didn't have a, a playoffs, they didn't have a postseason. They, they, they just sort of voted on who was the, who was the best team. And uh, not everybody even played the same number of games. So it was, it was a little chaotic and, and the NFL was still trying to find it, find its footing. And they played against the bears in 1927. And, and there was actually two games left in the season. And they beat the Bears in that game, which which basically decided the championship. They were the two best teams in the league. And one of the key plays in that game, which I found so remarkable, was a fake punt on third down from the Giants' own end zone, which when you think about those three things, it, it's, just, it's just remarkable in, in today's game. But back then in 1927, the game was played in an entirely different way. There was, it, was, it was basically a field possession game. So you would, you would try to get chunks of yardage, and, and it was very low score. The games were very low scoring. Rarely did teams score more than 20 points. And so the Giants were playing the Bears, and the Bears were, were the dominant team of, of the era, George Hallis's Bears, and uh, they, they, they had all the, all the great players. And in 1927, they, they came to uh, the Polo Grounds. They were playing, playing the Giants. And the Giants were backed up at their own three-yard line. And on third down, they decided to punt. And uh, so, so the, the Bears were ready, were ready for the punt. And then it was so muddy that the, uh, the quarterback, uh, his name was Hinky Haynes, I'd never even heard of his name, uh, asked the official to wipe the mud off the ball before they snapped it. And the official did. And while everybody was paying attention to the official wiping the mud off the ball, Hinky Haynes came up. He moved about th- about three yards up, rather than uh, the, the traditional depth for the punt. And so, no, but the Bears didn't notice that. So when they they snapped the ball to Hinky Haynes, he was able to actually throw a pass. They gained about thirty yards, and all of a sudden they were out of their own they're out of their own end zone, uh, and, and and able to uh, to con- to gain a big chunk of yardage in in an instant in a in, a, in an era when. Uh, gaining gaining yards uh, at that increment was was really unheard of. So uh, that was really the first miracle moment on the field for the Giants. Uh, I thought that was uh, you know really interesting, especially when you compare it to the way the game is played today. Uh, you know, with, with with the high scoring games and the and the passing and and all the strategy. Uh, you know, we we as I, as I said in the book, you know, we th- we think about you know, daring calls like the onside kick by the Saints in the Super Bowl and, and the Philly special by the Eagles a couple of years ago. Uh, but, but that was really, you know, one of the, one of the most, uh, you know, gutsiest calls, I think, that, that the Giants have ever, have ever made. To call a fake punt on third down uh, in, your, in your own end zone is, is, is pretty incredible. Uh, the book went through uh, the, the 1950s, which uh, was is sort of the golden age of, of Giants football. You had Gifford and uh, uh, Elman Tunnell and uh, Rosie Brown and, uh, you know, all, all the Hall of Famers there at that time. Uh, Lombardi and Landry were the, were the coaches. Uh, but that team only won one championship. They were in the championship game just about every year. Uh, but they only they only won the one championship. So I call it if people call it the golden age of Giants football. I call it the silver age because they they more often than not got the silver medal uh, for those uh, for the for those seasons uh, coming in second to the the Bears and the Packers and the and the Browns sometimes. And then and then of course there was the dark times in the in the 60s uh, and and the 70s uh, when uh, they were flying airplanes over the stadium saying uh, uh, you know to leave and and uh, uh, fire, fire the coaches and, and things like that. Uh, and all of that turned around uh, when they hired uh, George Young uh, as the general manager. And there's, there's a chapter on that. 
Uh, George Young, of course, was uh, became the general manager, and and he came in at a time when when the ownership of the team was was split between uh, Wellington Mara, who we mentioned before, and and his nephew Tim, who had inherited his half from from his father, Wellington's brother, uh, and they were so at odds that they didn't even speak together, speak to each other. They at one point had dueling press conferences, which is which is hard to imagine. I, I, I try to think about NFL Network covering that this these days, or ESPN having a split screen and, and having the two the two co-owners of the team arguing basically uh, point for point in a debate at, at, at concurrent press conferences, uh, and they were so at a loss to find any type of agreement that they couldn't even agree on. Uh, who to, who to hire because if Wellington Mara had, had recommended somebody to be the general manager, then Tim Mara would automatically have, have uh, shot it down and, and vice versa. So what they came up with a scheme, they want, they, everybody knew that George Young would be a good hire. So, but neither Wellington nor Tim could uh, uh, nominate him, could, could suggest him because the other one would, would put the kibosh on it right away. And so they had to have, they had to kind of do an end around and, and have the commissioner come in and suggest that, uh, uh, that they hire George uh, rather, than, rather than one of the owners. And that's, that's how that happened. It was a, a kind of an interesting end around, a, a, a play action fake, I think, for, uh, for Wellington Mara to get his guy, George Young, in there without it seeming like it was his guy. Uh, and then we t- went through the, uh, through the 1980s and, and uh, of course, the, the the Bill Parcells era, the Lawrence Taylor era, uh, all those Super Bowls, and and that was a you know that was a really interesting interesting time because the Giants had been down for so long. Uh, Harry Carson, of course, was a was a tremendous uh, uh, player uh, for them. He was the, he was sort of the guy who had who had seen the dark times and 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 came through and 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 was able to be there for the for the championship. And and there's a chapter of him. Uh, on him, on him when he walked out to uh, do the coin toss in in uh, the first Super Bowl against the Broncos, and he was the only captain. The Broncos had about seven or eight players out there for the coin toss, and Harry Carson was sort of the lone gunman walking out there. It was like a Gary Cooper moment when uh, uh, Harry Carson went out there to, to face to face them all down. And uh, Harry was great re- recollecting uh, that moment. He he has that picture up in his uh, in his living room, in fact, of him. Uh, at midfield. And he said, you know, he, at first he thought he didn't understand why he was being sent out there, but I think he came to understand eventually why uh, Bill Parcells and the Giants wanted him to be the, the their sole representative at the time. They, they actually had three, three captains, George Martin and Phil Sims were also the captains, uh, but Harry Carson was, was the only one who went out. Uh, and then of course it comes, comes through to the, to the Eli Manning years. Uh, you know, the, the miracle that he is uh, that he's even drafted and 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 acquired by the Giants, not even drafted by the Giants. He was drafted by the Chargers. Uh, he's he's at the he's in New York City in the hotel. He's talking to a bunch of reporters. Uh, he's he's about going to the, to San Diego and and playing for the Chargers. And a ten year old kid w- runs in and says, "Hey, Eli Manning's been traded." And it's it's everybody looks at each other like, "What? What's what's going on?" And Eli Manning says, turns to uh, one of the NFL security guys and says. This, that right, and it turns out, of course, it was the the kid had been watching um, the broadcast on a TV in the in the in, in, on on the side of the room, and and had seen that the the trade had gone down between the Giants and the Chargers for Eli Manning, uh, and and of course everybody was happy. Eli Manning did not want to play for the Chargers, uh, got his wish to come to New York, and uh, uh, you know the the rest is uh, New York Giants football history, as they say. Um, in terms of uh, the the structure of uh, of writing the book, I th- I thought it was very it was very interesting to go through the process, and and it still is interesting to go through the process. So the book came out in September, and it's it's sort of a strange thing with books that I still don't know how many we've sold because I won't get the audit until June, uh, so that that's kind of a strange uh, dynamic. Uh, you know, I'm told it did did pretty fairly well over the, over the holiday season. Uh, and in terms of sales, uh, I know it was sold out on Amazon and, and a lot of the Barnes and Noble stores uh, in, in the area. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, actual numbers, uh, you know, that, that won't be done for a couple of, couple of more months still. 
uh, which is kind of strange. They do it in six month increments uh, in terms of uh, the sales and, and things like that and, and the auditing of the uh, accounting of the, of the sales of the book. So uh, for uh, in June, I'll find out how the sales went from last June through the end of December. Uh, which is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see, uh, you know, what, exactly how that, how that came through. Uh, the other part of the book, actually the hardest part of the book, and, and my recommendation to any of you who are, who are ever going to write a book, it was uh, uh, securing the photographs. Uh, that had to be, I had to do that myself, which was uh, quite the task. Uh, in fact, uh, because a lot of the older photographs, it was a little unclear about who actually owned the rights. The giants don't have the, a lot of the rights to those photos. Uh, and then uh, the Hall of Fame used to have a lot of the rights to the photos, but they, gave, they sold those a few years ago to the Associated Press. So now the Associated Press holds the rights to most of the iconic photos that you, that you know. And by, by that, they, that means that they sell the rights to, <laughs> to those photos. And, and so I had, to, I had to negotiate prices with those and uh, and, buy, and buy them myself. And so there's a reason why in the YA Tittle book and the YA Tittle chapter, for example, that we make mention of the famous tit photograph of him with the blood trickling down his head and, and kneeling on the field uh, and, and the place that that has in his, uh, in his living room. Uh, but we don't show the photograph. And, and the reason is because the, it was just too expensive. It, it would, have, would have eaten into too much of the profits too to uh, have it included in the book. So we, we kind of picked and chose our, our way through there. Uh, uh, the Giants were kind enough to give, uh, to allow us to, to print, reprint some of, the, some of their photos that they have. Uh, and Newsday, we used, we used some of Newsday's file photos too. Uh, since I worked there, they were, uh, we, we worked out a deal. They, they didn't give them to me for free, but, uh, but uh, we, we did work out a, a little bit of a reduced rate for for about nine or ten of the uh, of the photographs that you see in the book, so that's the uh, that's the history of of uh, miracle moments in New York Giants football history. Uh, I don't know if you guys have any uh, questions about the book. I know Jeff has a bunch of questions about covering the NFL these days, which we can get to. But if anybody has any questions about the book, I guess the best way to do it, Liz, is for them to chat it. Or how how do you want to do this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can just send through the chat. Um, there is a question here oh. uh, from Al's iPad. If Isaiah Simmons is such a special talent and the Giants' biggest problem is their defense, why wouldn't it be a no-brainer to draft him? Offensive linemen are usually not game changers. Defensive players can be. That's a good question. I think I think it is a no-brainer to to draft him. I think I th I think that's that's the guy that they need to pick, uh, because offensive line. Listen, they have to, they have to fix the offensive line. That, there's no question about that. Um, and in terms of protecting Daniel Jones, and in terms of <clears throat> opening holes for Saquon Barkley, you need you need that that muscle up front, and you need you, you need players there. I think in this draft. There are a lot of good offensive tackles and centers that they can pick from on the second day, meaning uh, the second and third rounds of the draft. Uh, maybe even even in the in the in the fourth round, you could probably get a starter. That's how deep this offensive line class is. When you look at the top of the offensive line uh, group, uh, you know a lot of people talk about uh, the kid Beckton from Louisville, um, the kid uh, uh, Werfs from Iowa. Uh, Wills from uh, Alabama and Thomas from Georgia. Uh, you know, you ask four different scouts or four different analysts who the, who the who they think the top offensive lineman is, and and you'll get four different answers, uh, which which scares me a little bit about those guys because if there's no standout, if there's no dominant player, then then how are they going to be a standout and a dominant player on the field in in the league? So I think that there's a lot of similarities and there's not as much fall off at offensive line as you get deeper and deeper into the draft. When you look at linebacker and you look at, at, at defensive players though, there is a, a, a bigger, bigger fall off. And I think Simmons is the kind of guy who uh, stands out among, among his group. You know, he can do so many different things. Uh, he can, he can, uh, you know, we talk about 
uh, sideline to sideline linebackers, you know, guys, guys, you can make plays from, from sideline to sideline. And, and I've sort of taken the calling Isaiah Simmons and an end, end zone to end zone linebacker, which is, you know, he can drop back and he can cover people and make interceptions and he can, he can rush forward too and, and, and sack the quarterback and, and make plays behind the line of scrimmage. Uh, so he's, he's the type of guy that can cover all the field. He's not a, he's not a great inside tackler, but the Giants did just sign Blake Martinez to, to kind of do that job for them. Uh, so I think my, my guess, if, if, I was in, if I was in the seat, I would, I would take Isaiah Simmons just because, at number four, uh, just because I think that, like I said, he's, he's, um, you're not going to get a similar level of that play uh, at his position in the second round, whereas a, with an offensive lineman, I think you can find a pretty similar uh, level of uh, level of play later later in the draft. We may even have to trade up into later into late in the first round, like they did last year with DeAndre Baker. Uh, but I think that uh, you know, in terms of the offensive line, uh, you know, they they definitely need some f- some fresh blood there. But th- I don't see a I don't see a number four overall pick among the offensive line prospects. Hope that helps. Okay, so Jeff, if you want to um, go through some of your questions, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm on. There you go. Just for starters, Tom, uh, we know that Eli left for the right reason. It was time. He, he left intact. He's physically, you know, in good shape. You see, like Tom Brady being well, leaving the Patriots and going down south. You see. Uh, Dubris staying in New Orleans. Other than the money, what do they have left to prove? And is it really good at their age to stay on? What, what is the consensus around the NFL with that? Well, my, my feeling has always been, and, and I've had this since, you know, long before we, we started talking about it in terms of, in terms of Eli Manning, is that it, it's, it's not really my place to tell somebody when to stop playing. Um, you know, if they feel like they can keep doing it and, and the, the team is willing to, to pay them to do it, uh, then, then have at it, you know, keep, keep going. I think, you know, with Eli Manning, I'm not sure that the market would have been there anyway for him. Uh, he would have been a free agent. He, he wasn't going to come back to the Giants, certainly not as the starting quarterback. Uh, you know, we, we're seeing right now, of course, you know, the, the, the pandemic has a lot to do with it, but there are certainly starting caliber, starting caliber quarterbacks out there. One was an MVP, Cam Newton, uh, who, who, who aren't with teams right now. So I think Eli Manning recognized that uh, he wasn't going to be given an opportunity like, like Drew Brees, like Tom Brady, uh, to, to be there and, and be, the, be the understood starter of a, of, of a team, whether it was the Giants or, or any of the other 31 teams this year. Uh, in terms of, of Breeze and, and Brady, I think that, uh, you know, once you retire, that's it. So, um, you know, do it as long as you can. That, that, that goes for anything, too. You know, as, as, as long as you're happy happy, and, and they get fulfillment out of it, uh, you know, more, more power to them, you know. And, and, and I think that we've sort of become accustomed now to these, these guys playing deep into their 30s and even into their 40s as, as Breeze and and um, and Brady are doing. Uh, I'm going to be curious to see how whether this is a long-term trend or uh, just an anomaly of a generation that that's able to do that. You know, we're, we're, we've already seen Andrew Luck, who was sort of in the in the previous generation, tap out and say that that's enough. And you know, it's going to be curious. I'm going to be very curious to see at what age this new generation of quarterbacks, uh, you know, Patrick Mahomes and uh, the guys, the guys of, of his, uh, uh, of his status, uh, how, you know, how long they last in the league, because, um, yeah, you know, I, I listen, playing, doing anything at 40 is, is, is hard and, and playing it, playing in the NFL is, is certainly no exception. And, and that, that these guys are going to be able to do it is pretty special. I think. Another question that was forwarded, um, you know, we know you, most of the people in business of sports know you over the years, but the life of a person in your profession is very demanding, 
Uh, you've been kind enough and others that have come from Newsday have usually come on your day off. Mm -hmm. What is your life like, you know, both in season and out of season? And how much of a hardship is that on your family? Because you have a wife and three children, and I'm sure you would like to spend more time with them, especially on the weekends. But maybe give people an idea of the complexity of your professional life. I always get a, I always get a kick out of weekends because uh, that's, you know, that's sort of when we, uh, you know, when we really kick it into high gear. Uh, you know, we have editors, of course, that, that work Monday through Friday, like, like normal, like mm -hmm. and on Fridays, they'll say, have a good weekend. And on Mondays, they'll say, how was your weekend when we, when we meet with them? And it's always, you know, I, I always kind of, kind of chuckle at that because I say, well, I, I didn't really have a weekend. I, you know, I was covering, <laughs> you know, traveling to, to uh, Nashville or, or San Francisco or wherever, wherever it happened to be and, you know, covering it, covering an NFL game all, all day. So, um, you know, I haven't had a su I've never haven't had a Super Bowl party in 15 years. So, I haven't been to, haven't been to a Super Bowl party. So, uh, you know, all those things are are kind of uh, uh, strange dynamics. Uh, I'll I'll tell you. You know, usually our uh, our days off are Tuesdays, uh, which works out well for for this class, Jeff. You usually meet on Tuesdays, uh, so I'm so I'm usually able to to come in to come in then. Uh, and then uh, basically during the season, it's, it's uh, uh, Tuesdays I'm working from home. And, and when I say a day off, that, that's, that's working from home because the next day's paper is Wednesday. And, and that's going to be filled with all kinds of advanced stuff for the, for the upcoming game. Uh, in terms of the off season, we'll talk about a normal one first, and then we'll talk about the <laughs> one we're going through right now, which is anything but normal. Uh, the off season is, is, is filled with, with activity and, and, uh, uh, you know, I'm not driving from my home in Long Island to New Jersey every day, like I am during, during the regular season to, to watch the practices and, and be in the locker room with the players every day. Uh, but it's filled with, uh, you know, from, uh, in, we go from the, the end of the Super Bowl in early February and then, uh, sort of a, about two weeks of taking a breather. And then we're right back in Indianapolis for the combine to talk to talk to the new crop of players and and talk to the coaches and scouts down there and sort of get the first sense of how they feel about the the upcoming draft uh and then right after the combine is mart is early march and that's free agency uh and then late march they have uh, the league meetings usually and so we're traveling to uh, arizona or florida to to talk about the new rules and and hear the hear the teams discuss their plans and, and, and meet with the coaches in sort of a more informal, informal setting. Uh, and then from, from, then we go right into April and that's, that's the draft. And, and that's when the teams start their off season programs too. Uh, and, and all of a sudden they're, they're back on the field uh, at the end of April and, and May, they have a, their mini camps and, and, and uh, in June, they, they, they have more mini camps. And then for basically the dark period is from, Usually Father's Day is about when things wrap up for their mini camps to uh, the middle of July. So there's about a month off there. I squeeze in my vacation time at that at that point. And then by the middle of July, they're back. They're right at training camp. And then it's a it, for, it's another six months of of day to day grind for the season. So there really has they've really uh, developed the NFL calendar so that there there is no lull except for that that one period from from mid June to mid July. Uh, that's by design too. The, the NFL wants to be in your face 11 months of the year as, as much as, as much as it can be, uh, and selling, selling its product. Uh, so the, you know, that said, it's probably the most humane of sports to cover because there is such a, such a routine to it. Um, you know, I always, we, I, I always joke and it's, uh, maybe I've told this, uh, to, to the class in the past, but you know, the NFL usually announces its schedule in April. And my family can go through then and say, okay, this is when we're going to go pumpkin picking. This is when we're going to cut down our Christmas tree. This is when we're going to, this is where we're going to be for Thanksgiving and, and things like that. Uh, because, because we know exactly what, what the schedule is going to, is going to be like. So if I'm on the road in, uh, you know, uh, the, the middle of October and then, and then ho have a home game in late October, like, okay, that's, that's when we're going to go pumpkin picking as a family. And, and so we, we can write that on the calendar in April. I don't, you know, it's kind of a strange uh, way to be organized around, around an NFL calendar, but uh, that's sort of, sort of what you have to do. Now, in terms of this year, being a sports writer with no sports, 
that's 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 been quite the challenge. Uh, and uh, you know, for for a lot of other sports, it's um, it's even more so. The NFL, of course, is is grinding right along, and and they they went through through their free agency period in March as they as they planned to, even though there was some tweaks to that in terms of. Uh, closing facilities and and limiting physical contact, uh, obviously from uh, between the players and the coaches and and travel and things like that. Uh, but the, but they went they went forward with with free agency and there was there was plenty to write about and uh, they're going forward with the draft and there's plenty to write about with that. Uh, you know as as you've probably seen in the in the hopefully seen in the pages of Newsday and uh, on on Newsday dot com. Uh, you know the, there's a, there's the way that they're going about the business is, is changing a, a lot. Uh, you know, the, the NFL just announced yesterday that, that they've come to an agreement with the, with the Players Association to start the off-season training programs on uh, next Monday on the 20th. And they're obviously not going to be able to do that in person. So they're going to do it much the way that, we, that we're doing this right now. They're going to have, have Zoom classes. And, and Joe Judge, the new head coach of the Giants, is going to stand there like, like – like I'm sit or sit there, like I'm sitting here, and uh, and and address the team as as best he can, and and people are going to be other players are going to be able to log in, and they're going to go over the playbook and and start start the installation of 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 what the Giants are going to look like on the field in 2020, assuming that they get on the field in 2020. The draft is 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 going forward full steam ahead, uh, even though. The, the principal uh, uh, participants in, in, in that process, the scouts, the general manager, the, the, uh, the personnel department, they're all working from home as well. So they're having meetings just like this also. And they're going through different scenarios and situations and carving through the, through the game film of the, of the prospects that they're looking at. And of course, when the draft actually comes, it's gonna be a completely different situation because uh, they're gonna be drafting from home uh, instead, instead of their uh, their own facilities, so uh, the, the league has worked with them to do uh, to set up the technology to be able to do that on a secure line. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, secrecy involved in the in the draft, and and a lot of security that needs to be uh, taken into account more than you know more than this conversation. Obviously, that there's there's a lot more at stake for for those teams, so. Uh, they're they're working out that system now, and they're gonna. It's basically I don't know if, how many people are are involved in fantasy football, but it, it's basically going to be a, a fantasy football draft where you click on a click on a player, move him from from column A to column B, and and he's your guy. And then they they announce it, and and the next team is on the clock. Uh, it's it's going to be broadcast on NFL Network and and ESPN. It's going to be uh, uh, Roger Goodell is going to be in his basement in in. Uh, uh, in New York, and, and he's going to introduce the draft, and they're going to have uh, a, a lot of the draft prospects at home, just just like we are right now. And so, I think when you watch the draft, it's going to be it's going to be a very interesting dynamic uh, to uh, to see it. it it's going to be for those of us who've who've been living in Zoom and and Microsoft Teams and and FaceTimes and Skype and all those things. It's, it's actually going to be a, probably a, a pretty familiar sight. Uh, to to be able to sit sit back and watch, uh, watch watch the watch the NFL work the way that most of us have been working from home for the last month. So I want to combine a couple of the questions now. Uh, sure. You know, we we know that the last few seasons have been very difficult for the Giants, and now you're a frequent uh, guest on, you know, talk sports radio and TV programs. I know you had a very glowing review you know, by some of the, uh, your colleagues in the field, you're both on radio and television. When you go on, I know you're a very honest person. You really talk about, and you tell it like it is. The players who have been on these losing teams, especially the last three years, probably like to hear good things about themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you have to really tell it like, you know, somebody screwed up and that's, that's life. Do they, are they more receptive to you uh, if you give them glowing stories or are they uh, okay even if you say look you could have done better you know and hopefully in the future you will how are they when you go into the locker room or try to interview them well nobody's happy losing so so going into a locker room after a loss is is is, is always hard um you, you know what these are these guys are at such a high level to be in the nfl that they know when they screwed up. They know they know when when they cost the team a game. They know when they cost the team a play. 
So they have no problem being called out for those things. Uh, they have, they really, really are generally pretty honest and, and forthright. If you, as long as you ask them respectfully and don't, not in a blame way, but say, you know, ask them what happened on this particular play or what were you thinking? What did you see? Things like that. They'll generally be able to, to break it down pretty, pretty neatly and, and uh, go back and uh, walk you through the, the process of how the, how the play fell apart. I've never had a problem with a player uh, who, uh, uh, who I was critical of for their, for their play. Uh, come up to me and, and, and complain about it or, or anything like that. Uh, where you get into a little bit of trouble is sometimes on defense, uh, it can look like somebody is in the wrong spot, but they're actually covering for somebody else who was in the wrong spot first. And so they wind up closer to the play and, and all of a sudden it looks like, you know, it looks like Jeff Hollander was supposed to be covering that tight end uh, and, and, and he's getting beat, but, uh, but it was, you know, it was, it was really Liz Wilson who, who was supposed to be covering that. So uh, I think when, when things like that happen, it's really important to be able to have a conversation with the players and to be able to, to get to the bottom of what happened. Now, now the players aren't going to throw each other under the bus. So you, so you really have to be astute and sort of work some back channels and, uh, and try and figure out exactly what happened. In terms of the the actual losing, like I said, you know nobody likes to lose, and and locker rooms can get grumpy, and and you know they have they have personalities, and uh, the Giants I think have have done a pretty good job of bringing in a group of players who have been, uh, you know, they talk about changing the culture a lot, and and that's one of the things that that they've done is that they've brought in a, a bunch of guys who don't accept losing, but are um, I guess more professional about losing. Uh, you know, they, they, there are guys who, who can turn out to be real jerks when, you know, when they're confronted with adversity and there are people who, uh, you know, take the adversity. And, and like I said, it's not that they're, they're accepting of it and not that they're, they enjoy it. Uh, but they understand that it's, that it's part of a process and, and, and they can use it, use it to build forward. And I think that most of the Giants players that, that they have now uh, are, are of that type. And, and you just have to hope that, if you're building a team like that, that they don't get used to losing, that they don't get accustomed to it, that they don't get numb to it, uh, which is which is another another danger that that the players can completely check out and and just not be interested lose lose interest in in the season uh, once it once it starts to to spiral out of control. You wrote some fascinating articles the past season about uh, Eli Manning and what he was going through, being basically benched and pretty much forgotten. You know, he, he never got in some games at all, and even his final game. Uh, you also wrote a fascinating piece about 13 people in the organization that spoke glowingly about him as a man and as a professional and as a more than just a football player. What was your relationship and how did you, I mean, obviously you wrote about it, but I mean, you must have been very sad in a way to see him go, especially at an earlier age than some of these other franchise type uh, great players, you know, that are still out there and are going on or trying to go on for another year or two. So how did you feel? It must have been very bittersweet, you know, to wish him well, but at the same time to lose who my guess would might have been a very good friend in the locker room. Right. Well, you know, I always say as sports writers, we don't root for wins and losses. We root, for, we root for good stories. And the 2019 season for the Giants from last April to the end of the season and at, at the end of December was a great story. It was a story. It was a season of two quarterbacks. And so the minute that they drafted Daniel Jones, that was basically the end of the end of Eli Manning. And it was just a matter of when that was going to happen. And I thought it was a really fascinating to uh, follow that season throughout um, uh, throughout, throughout its, uh, its, its arc really, uh, you know, I, th I think that the change happened to Daniel Jones probably faster than than most people thought it would have happened. Uh, and then and then to see Eli come back, it was it was really, you know, that that whole season is is it was it was a failure, obviously, in, in terms of football, but in terms of a, of a story and and like I said, the arc and and the big picture of it. 
uh, it was it was really really an interesting interesting one to cover. You know, you you really felt like you were in the middle of history. And just to get back to the book a little a little bit, you know, one of the things I found with with a lot of the miracle moments that we covered was that they were uh, prefaced by really struggled struggling times, really really dark times for for the franchise. And I, I, you know, I tried to buoy the spirits of a lot of Giants fans last year as they were grousing about the the fate of their team and and the losing streak. Uh, that 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 usually happens with with this franchise. That there's uh, there's a lull. There's a there's a sort of a rock bottom, and 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 there's a there's a real uh, bottoming out, and then and then all of a sudden there's it, things things take off again, uh, and and so I wouldn't be surprised if that happens again with the Giants and and Daniel Jones and Saquon Barkley. Uh, in terms of uh, Eli Manning, uh, you know, he is a uh, he, you know he I always I the, the the best anecdote I can give you is that. Uh, Every what Eli Manning never said no to to a question from me. Uh, you know, most quarterbacks have special days and they talk on podiums and uh, they don't answer questions individually. Uh, Eli Manning answered every question I ever had, and a lot of them were ridiculous and a lot of them were silly, and a lot of them were just to sort of get a reaction out of him and or, or to make him laugh or smile or uh, or something like that and make him think maybe. Um, and uh, you know, he he humored me uh every time and the one time that he was benched uh about three years ago uh geno smith was took over for for a week as the quarterback and i'm I'm sure a lot of you remember that that very emotional week and geno smith smoke on a spoke on wednesday to to the group and i uh on thursday i was in the locker room and i had a a follow-up question for geno smith and i said hey you know yeah you got a second can i can i just ask you a quick question and he said no, man, I, I just spoke yesterday. And, and that really, that's when I really <laughs> began to appreciate Eli Manning uh, because he is going, he was never uh, shooting down uh, a request for, a, for just a minute of a question. You know, he, he would answer every question uh, until, until we, we ran out of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think that's going to be missed in the locker room. I hope selfishly, uh, I hope that's something that Daniel Jones took from Eli Manning uh, during their, during their year together. Uh, you know, it seems like he did, you know, it it was a very, you know, we, we talked about how hard last year was on Eli Manning too. Uh, I think it was a hard year for Daniel Jones. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine coming into a situation like that where, where you're being asked to, uh, take over for, uh, basically a living legend, uh, and not only, not only take over, but, but the living legend is in the locker next to you. So, uh, it's, it's really, really was a strange dynamic for him. And, and I'm, I'm very curious to see as, the, as this season goes forward, it, assuming it does again, um, you know, how he finds his own footing as, as the, as the quarterback of the New York giants, because that's, that's a role that he sort of was only able to half put his put on last year. You know, Eli Manning still had the captain C on his uniform, even though he wasn't playing Eli, he was still Eli Manning. Eli Manning's picture was, you know, p- painted on murals around the building and, and literally it's literally etched in glass in the, in, in the cafeteria. So every time you go to get something to eat, you see Eli Manning escaping from a sack and throwing that pass to David Tyree. Uh, you know, that, 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 that really, that, that could that could be a strange a strange situation to be in as the guy who's replacing such a beloved figure not only from the fan base but but certainly from from the organization itself uh so i th- i'm very curious to see how daniel jones uh reacts to it uh you know the indications that that i have from him so far are are that he's going to he's going to be pretty good he may not be at eli's eli's level in in terms of that but uh i i think he'll be uh be functional i don't think he'll he'll be geno smith with it either Okay. Uh, Liz, I know I you have a few questions, questions Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah some of, them, some, some of them just came in on the notes. Yeah. So says Tom, link? can you compare, <clears throat> can you compare Eli Manning's career versus Ben Roethlisberger? Do you mm-hmm. think both desire a place in the NFL hall of fame? That's from Ben. Right. 
Well, you know, certainly those those two careers are always going to be be compared. And uh, you know, if they each won two Super Bowls, Ben's been to a third. I think Ben certainly had the benefit of having been on better teams. Uh, you know, his first Super Bowl, he, he, you know, he was just kind of along for the ride with that team. Uh, the second Super Bowl, he was he was a little bit more of a, of a part of it. Uh, so, I think that they'll both be in the Hall of Fame. You know, it's it's interesting. Um, I go back and forth on Eli Manning as a Hall of Famer because I, I feel like a Hall of Fame quarterback needs to be a lifter, uh, you know, somebody who, who lifts people. And, and people say, well, Eli Manning didn't have the tools. He didn't have the players around him. But I think a lot of the Hall of Fame quarterbacks that we think of that do have those people around them made them that way. You know, I, I'm, I'm not sure that Eli Manning – is is a uh, you know first ballot Hall of Famer or, or even a Hall of Famer period uh, when it when it comes to that he certainly has some great numbers I I think Eli Manning's impact on the league is defined by plays and moments and not wins and certainly his his 500 career record uh, you know without without having a winning record as a, as a starting quarterback that's a that's a knock on him. Um, you know, it's the last, last seven years of his career, the, t- the team struggled and was perennially at the bottom of the league. Uh, you know, I, I go back and forth a lot on who failed whom over the last eight years since, since that 2011 Super Bowl team. Did, the, did, did Eli Manning let down the Giants or did the Giants let down Eli Manning? And, uh, you know, it's probably more of the Giants letting down Eli Manning in terms of how they, how they built the team and how they – how they tried to replace the offensive line and some of the other key, key components there. But, uh, you know, I, I think Eli Manning has, you know, needs, needs to shoulder some of that as some of that as well, as well. I, they'll probably both wind up in the hall of fame. Uh, uh, you know, Roethlisberger certainly uh, will, will be there just be on the, on the basis of his two uh, Super Bowls, And, and we'll, we'll certainly see what he, what he brings to the table when he comes back from victory uh, uh, from his injury. Uh, um, next season again assuming that there is a next season and uh you know eli manning's career is is uh punctuated now so 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 that's over um he's certainly the greatest giant not the greatest giants player uh that that belongs to lawrence taylor and and probably there's about six or seven players that you could put ahead of eli manning in terms of uh, on-field uh, contributions to the team, but in terms of actually being a giant and what the what the Giants think of as being a giant, in terms of uh, being the face of the franchise and and being uh, trusted and 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 loved by the by the organization, uh, I think I think he's the greatest giant of all time. And uh, you know he's he is uh, what what Frank Gifford was to Wellington Mara. I think Eli Manning will be to. Uh, to John Mara in terms of uh, a confidant and just somebody who will always represent the Giants in a way that that the organization and the owners want want to be represented. Thank you. And here's one from Richard. With Schumer gone and a new coach and offensive coordinator, what changes do you see for the team? Well, there's going to be a lot of changes. You know, Joe Judge is, is has brought in a, a whole new coaching staff. And uh, he's going to, uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of what we saw defensively from the Patriots, which is a, a matchup, uh, matchup scheme in terms of, you know, finding weaknesses of other teams and trying to exploit them rather than doing what, what they want to do, regardless of how, of how the matchup is. So I think in some games you're going to see, Daniel Jones throw 45 times. And in some games you're going to say, see Saquon Barkley carry the ball 30 times. And it's going to be a mix of those things. And they're going to, on defense, you're going to, uh, you're going to see them. Sometimes they're going to be in a, in a four man front. Sometimes they'll be in a three man front. Sometimes they may be in a two or a five man front. They're going to be very creative. uh, Try to exploit the, uh, the skills that their players have and uh, mitigate the deficiencies that their players have. There's no, there are very few perfect players in the NFL and, and everybody, most of them can do something really well and do things, do other things not so well. And so I think this coaching staff is really going to be in tune to, 
finding those things and and using the using them to their benefit as as best they can. Okay, and we have another one from Harold Leff. If you had to pick one incredible play in Giants history, would it be the David Tyree catch? Yeah, well, that's that one certainly, uh, you know, <laughs> cer certainly certainly ranks up there. Uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, the, the uh, you know a lot of, a lot of the miracle moments in the book are uh, moments that are were, were were built towards and sort of um, you know. I hesitate to call them miracles. They, they, you know, people worked worked hard for them, and you know, the, the timing just happened to be right, and things like that. Um, that that catch was was a miracle. <laughs> it was that 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 whole play was a miracle. That you know, you, you go back to Eli Manning escaping uh, the sack, the referee not blowing it dead. Uh, you know, Eli Manning almost he almost shovels the ball to Chris Snee. Uh, who's an offensive lineman standing in front of him. That would have been a penalty that would have ended the game. Uh, you know, and, then, and then he does exactly what you're not supposed to do at that moment and throw the ball blindly down the middle of the field. And David Tyree happens to be there and catches the ball and pins it to the side of his head and comes down with it. And, uh, you know, I think it's a play that every time, every time you watch it, it's hard to comprehend exactly how it comes together. And then you look at David Tyree and who he was, you know, he was a, he was a special teams player for them. He was the fourth receiver. Uh, he may not have even been active in that game if Plaxico Burris had, had been completely healthy. Uh, so, so all of a sudden he is, he's thrust into this situation where he has to, to step up as a wide receiver uh, and, and, and he makes the, the most incredible catch uh, in, in Super Bowl history, maybe maybe in NFL history, uh, so I, I think that that play definitely ranks as as uh, the miracle of miracles for uh, in terms of Giants history. Thank you. So Jeff, that that wraps up my questions from that room. Okay, I had one other uh, Tom that had been submitted. You know, mm -hmm. the the Giants and the Jets really have great fans. I mean, met. Now, the stadium is usually full every Sunday, no matter how good or bad the teams are. Recently, I think Forbes came out with, again, you know, with the most valuable franchises in the country. And even though the Cowboys were clearly the top, the Giants are still way up there. I think they're either second or third. The same can be said for the, uh, the Knicks, who are basically horrible on the court, but they're the most valuable franchise still. And the Yankees, who are generally much better on the field, they're still number one in baseball as the most valuable franchise. So what do you attribute to the fact that the, the Giants can stay up there so long without you know, maybe delivering the best product on the field? What is unique about the fans in the, I guess, our metropolitan area? Well, I don't think it has to do with so much with the fans as, as the assets of, of each of those teams that you mentioned, which is that they own their stadiums. Um, so, so that's, that's the value They're They're not, um, they're not leasing a, a facility that's, that's owned by, uh, you know, the, the city or the county or, or things like that. They, they, each of them has, uh, an ownership in, in their stadium. And that's where, that's where the money comes from. So there's no, they don't have to pay rent. They don't have to, to do all those things. Uh, you know, when, every time they open the doors at MetLife stadium, the, whether it's for a concert or for, uh, uh, a, a soccer game or for uh, WrestleMania, like it was a, a year ago, uh, or for an NFL, for an NFL game, uh, the Giants and the Jets get get money out of that. They 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 share ownership of that stadium. So I think that's really a um, uh, where where the value is. And you look at at Dallas and Jerry Jones. He he has the same same deal with his stadium. And so whenever there's an NBA All Star game. Or, or things like that in, in uh, a Cowboys stadium at AT&T stadium now, which, which also adds to the value of it by, by selling that naming, right. Uh, you know, that, that money goes to, goes to Jerry Jones. So that's, that's where the value of those, of those teams comes from. It's not, it's not necessarily the, the actual ticket sales. It's, it's that the tickets sales go directly to, uh, to, to that, to that franchise. Uh, in terms of uh, the fan base, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very curious actually to see how this current situation affects crowds at 
games. You know, I, I, I'm sure there was a lot of people that are going to be hesitant to be surrounded by 75,000 fellow screaming people who are, could be carrying anything that, you know, any, any kind of virus or things like that. So uh, it's going to be uh, very interesting to see how, how that all, all shakes out once, once the teams actually do get back on the field. Bob Berman just uh, chatted in the question, uh, was it smart for them to trade Odell when they did? With Odell Beckham, I always say this, you can be a great player. You can be a terrific person. You can be a fantastic teammate and you can be a terrible employee. And that's what, that's what Odell Beckham Jr. was. He was, he was a bad employee. And so the Giants, uh, you know, going back to what we remember, what we were just talking about a minute ago in terms of what they think of a giant being a giant and Eli Manning being the greatest giant. Well, Eli Odell Beckham Jr. was, was not that. And so they, uh, I think they made the, a good choice and a good timing to, uh, to trade him. Uh, you know, he was, um, he was never going to be happy uh, playing with Eli Manning and uh, you know, would he have been happier with, with Daniel Jones or if they had gone switched quarterbacks earlier? Uh, that's hard to say. Um, but uh, Odell's kind of a, you know, kind of his own person. Uh, you know, he, he's, he's unlike anybody I've ever covered uh, in terms of things finding their way to him and him being a part of news cycles and, and things that just don't seem to happen to other, other athletes. It's, it's sort of a very strange cross of celebrity and paparazzi and internet and football and, and things like that. And, and I, I think the giants, the giants are a very old fashioned organization They They, they like to think of themselves as a mom and pop organization still in turn in, in a, in a very corporate NFL world. And I, I don't think that they were ready for that kind of distraction off the field, sometimes on the field. Uh, and uh, I think that they, they made the decision that they, they needed to go in, in another direction. Uh, I think they, they felt like, too, that they were probably not going to win a championship with Odell. Uh, so it didn't necessarily make as much sense to uh, – you know, carry him along through what was projecting to be some some rough times in in a rebuild, uh, when he would certainly uh, not uh, not be happy with that and and undoubtedly express that displeasure uh, publicly. Right. We uh, before we were just about out of time, but you know, one of the things that's been coming up, and you know, especially those of us that are reading online with Newsday. Uh, your colleague Dave Lennon has been constantly, you know, giving us updates uh, in his articles about uh, what may or may not happen. Uh, do you have any inside scoop on if baseball is going to come back? And if, you know, I mean, other than the fact that we keep reading, they may go uh, Cactus League and Grapefruit League, you know, we have a Florida and Arizona attempt to get the thing going. But many of us, as we wait for football in the fall, and you seem to be in the best position to really have a season professionally from all the sports, but Baseball is, you know, always a concern, yet, you know, with no fans and no home team games, uh, it's going to be bizarre to say the least if it ever even comes to fruition. Have you heard anything that we haven't? Well, yeah, no, I, I read Dave. That's it. That's my, that's, that's my insight into baseball. Uh, I know that they, I think last night they played the first game in Korea, in South Korea, uh, the, fir the first game of their league in, in an empty stadium. Um, uh, and, and, and we're able to get, to get their league back going. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because if you're not, if you're not going to play in front of fans, then you really don't need the big stadiums. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious to see how they're, how they're going to do that. Obviously they have minor league facilities, but I don't even think you need, you need places that, that large. Um, you know, one of the things that I was going to be covering this spring was, was the final four. And for a while there, they were toying with the idea of playing it without fans. I don't know if you remember. Uh, there was a couple of days there where it seemed like they were going to go forward with the NCAA tournament and, and just have it in, in closed gymnasiums. And so they, they were going to have it in, in the big football stadium in Atlanta, the Final Four. 
And then they said, well, if we're going to close it to the fans, there's, there's no reason to have it there. So they were actually going to have it at, uh, you know, I think the Hawks training facility, you know, they were, they were looking at different, different places. Uh, there was, I think there was a gym on a gym at Georgia tech that they were even, they were even looking at uh, using. So I think it's going to be uh, pretty interesting to, to see where they play these games. Not, not so much. I think it's going to be a while before they have fans before they, they before they have 50, 60, 30,000 people in, all in one place, obviously that's going to take a while. I think it's going to be, uh, interesting to see where they play in the meantime. You know, will it be in these big cathedrals that they've built for to hold that many people that that are going to be empty, or will they be playing on you know on sand lots and or you know just turf fields and you know, you know teams always say you know it's it's popular for football teams to say you know we'll play them anywhere we'll play them in the parking lot. Well, mm-hmm. we may <laughs> we may soon see that. Yeah. Well. I mean, it's a strange new world, and more importantly, I think, as you're alluding to, uh, we have to keep everybody safe and healthy. That's the first priority. Yeah. Everything else is secondary. But I know uh, for all of us that have joined in today, it's been a long haul without sports, and uh, it's gotten to the point where we're watching horse on you know, whatever is ESPN, which to me doesn't get. I've seen more exciting sporting events, but uh, you know, it is it is what it is, and that's all we've got left to play with. But uh, I just want to ask thing. if anybody else has any other questions before we leave. Um, if anybody wants to ask a, a last minute question, we can take a raise of hands. Anybody? Looks like Roger somebody has one. Else? Roger, let's see. Nice. Mm, yep, yeah, there we go. Hey, Roger, hi. you're unmuted. Hey, Tom, thank you very much. I, you've been very generous with your time, and I, I want to really appreciate, I want to tell you how much I appreciate you coming. I, I just have one question. By the way, you took over two full pages on Newsday Sports Section today. It was great. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, <laughs> that, 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 a lot of things happened yesterday. You're not kidding. I, I, I was interested in the uh, the article that you wrote about the teleconferencing, the, the team. Uh, will you be privy to that, uh, or, or, or is it strictly team only? No, that'll be, uh, you're talking about for the, uh, the off-season program? Yes, starting yeah. Monday, yeah. Right. So that, that'll that be just for the team. So that's going to be basically uh, the way maybe some of your uh, kids or grandkids are, are learning now in, in, in school with, uh, 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 you know, digital uh, tools and things like that. Yeah. Uh, that's the way that, that the players are going to be taught the, the playbook now. And, and so they'll have two hours each day and it'll be, it'll be closed because each, each of the players – has is a is issued an iPad from from the team or or some kind of device for the Giants is an iPad, and uh, so so it's it and it's locked from the, locked to the outside world. So the so the playbook is on that. They can watch film clips on that. Uh, they can call up film clips of of any player they want, and so it's pretty technologically advanced. It's it's kind of a kind of a spruced up iPad. And, Interesting. Uh, yeah, and so they'll they'll be able to have uh, you know have have meetings, virtual meetings, just like like I said, just like just like this one is, and they'll be, uh, you know, Joe Judge will be there, and and Jason Garrett and Patrick Graham and all the coaches, and then they'll break up into smaller groups, and uh, there's there's obviously limitations on what they can do in terms of uh, getting together on the field, and and right. there's going to be uh, limitations in terms of what the union has agreed to. Uh, for them they, they can only do it for two hours a day and they can only do it for uh, uh the giants can do it for four weeks most teams can do it for three the giants get an extra week because they have a new head coach uh and uh you know it'll be but it'll be it'll be closed just to the team and and uh it'll, you know for for a lot of them for some of them it won't be it won't be a, uh, as big of a jump as it is for for a lot of us because uh you know, they've gone through college and they, and they've had online courses and they've, they've had all exposure to, to online learning. So it's going to be uh, uh, very interesting. And of course, um, uh, Joe Judge is a, uh, uh, is, is nearly, nearly earned his doctorate in education. So he's familiar with a lot of the, t- the teaching tools for, for online and things like that too. So. Uh, not, not, like us old, not like us older guys. Right, right, right. So this, this is a good, this is a good, good time to have a 30, 38 year old head coach, I think, rather than uh, uh, <laughs> having hired somebody who's, who's been around the block a couple of times. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Thanks Roger. Fred has a question. So hang on. Uh, hi, Tom. Hey, uh, again, I, I, I echo Roger. Thanks for coming, as you have for over the years. Uh, on a personal note, 
what sports did you play growing up? And you have three kids. What sports do they play? I played uh, uh, baseball and basketball and football in high school and uh, uh, realized very quickly that uh, if I was going to get to uh, play in Yankee Stadium, it was going to be uh, not on the field, but in the press box. And so uh, when I was about, you know, I, I, I'm lucky enough to have been able to uh, have the job that I wanted when I was 14 years old. So that's, that's worked out pretty well. Uh, in terms of my kids, they, they all play sports. Uh, my oldest son is actually a, uh, uh, a manager. He, he goes to the University of Albany, and he's a, uh, one of the managers for the, for the basketball team there, uh, which uh, plays, plays the Seawolves twice a year and uh, lost, lost to them twice this year. Uh, so, but, he, but he goes there, and uh, he works with the basketball team, and so he's, he's involved with them. Uh, my, I have a daughter who plays lacrosse and uh, runs cross country and my son plays uh, soccer, baseball, basketball, you know, he's, he's 10 years old. So he, he, he does it all. Uh, so yeah, we're definitely a, a very sports, uh, sports focused family. Thank you. There was one other question. Somebody raised their hand. Was it, was it Lynn? Yes. There you go. Just very quickly. I got an interesting meeting shopping in Publix at Jupiter and I got to meet Bill Parcells shopping. And the interesting thing was he didn't have any toilet paper in his cart either. Oh, that's, that's, that's good to know. He was very so, great. See, no matter, how, no matter how many Super Bowl rings you have, everybody's, everybody's <laughs> got to deal with the pandemic the same way. That's funny. Correct. Thank that's you good. again. Hey Jeff, I just wanted to say too that you know normally if we were in person, I would I would offer to uh, you know sign sign any books that people had or or, or purchase. But um, you know if if they want to, uh, what what we've been doing for the books is is um, uh, I I make uh, like stickers to put in to put inside on the inside mm -hmm. cover of the book, and I I'll, I can write a message to anybody that they that they'd like uh, to mm -hmm. to have an autographed copy of the book. So just just uh, you know. It, maybe send an email to Jeff and he can forward it, forward a list to me. Uh, if anybody want, want, has a copy of the book that they want sort of virtually signed, I can, I can do it that way and, and, and mail them out to you. That would be great. Uh, anyway, Tom, again, as people have expressed, we really thank you for giving us your time. You know, you're, you're a genuine uh, person. You know, you're from the island. You're from our area. You give up your days off occasionally, you know, or mornings off for us. We do appreciate that so much. And just as much, you know, it's funny when I, I touch base with Tom after we shut down the beginning of March, I said, we'd still love to have you because he was originally scheduled for this day. And this was supposed to be our closing day at the Hilton Garden Inn for those that were doing the Tuesday uh, group. And, you know, he, he half kiddingly got back to me and said, Jeff, are you sure anybody still wants to hear about the Giants after the season we just had? Mm -hmm. And I said, it's not about the Giants, it's about you. And I think uh, those that are still with us this morning will agree that Tom is a unique sports writer. He's a caring person. He's a really, very knowledgeable person. And uh, it's always a pleasure to have you back. And we look forward to working with you again in the future. So we thank, thank you and uh, stay safe. Send our best to your family. We appreciate them giving up time. And uh, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Uh, I hope everybody stays healthy and uh, keeps making uh, healthy choices.